Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered today on Yom Teruah as we reckon it on our Creator's calendar, which happens to line up with the 11th of September for 2024 on the Gregorian calendar. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we just wanted to come together today. We're going to go over what we know of, or at least the um, main points for the first of the seventh month throughout what we know to be inspired texts so that everyone can can see for themselves what our creator has said about the topic at hand. I highly encourage everyone to look over the rest of this stuff in context because we probably won't be covering everything as it could be. And then if you happen to know of any other references, by all means, please share. The more we can know, the better off we are. Also, there are other references that were put together by a sister um, that was put in the Telegram chat, which I'll share with you too, so you can check those out for anyone that has the Dead Sea Scrolls. It, it has some more stuff in there, which is pretty neat. But the um, first reference, I'm going to try to go in chronological order. If I make any mistakes and you recognize it, you're, you're more than welcome to call me out, right? Because we're just trying to get the truth here. But the first reference that I'm familiar with of the first of the seventh month being kept as anything significant is from the book of Yobelim or Jubilees here in the account of the floods. So we're not going to read the whole thing, but just starting on the book of Jubilees, chapter five. Okay. And it goes through the wickedness of men, how they went apostate and what happened that Noah was told to make an ark. And then the events that happened during the flood which is the significant part. So right here, verse 29 of chapter 5, it says, And in the fourth month, the mountains of the great deep were closed, and the floodgates of the Shemaim were restrained. And on the new month of the seventh month, all the mouths of the abysses of the earth were opened, and the water began to descend into the deep below. Then it says, and on the new month of the 10th month, the tops of the mountains were seen. And on the new month of the first month, the earth became visible. And the waters disappeared from the earth in the fifth week of the seventh year thereof, or 1309 Aniomundi from creation, right? Now, that was the first reference. And then right after it here, in this is chapter six, right? It gives you what he did. We're just going to start right here. It mentions that this is a forever to keep these things, right? But it says, and on the new month of the first month, and on the new month of the fourth month, and on the new month of the seventh month, which is Yom Teruah, and on the new month of the tenth month are the days of remembrance, and the days of the seasons in their four divisions of the year. And these are written and ordained as a testimony forever. So these are actually known as the Days of Remembrance. And that is a, a, a title that's carried all the way through into the Dead Sea Scrolls. So um, while you have what we're going to read in Leviticus talking about the first of the seventh month and everything, you also have, if you look at the uh, 4Q321, the scroll from the Dead Sea Scrolls, 4Q321, specifically column four it talks about the seventh month beginning with maziyahu and the day of remembrance being in maziyahu meaning that that first of the seventh month is still called the day of remembrance even though it's also known as yom teruah and that's one oh. of the four days that are considered oh. that apart there um the only reason why i mention that is because the only one we have on record in the Bible that we commonly have is the day of Yom Teruah here, where this is considered a Sabbath. You don't do servile work. But the other days of remembrance, the first of the first month, the first of the fourth month, the first of the tenth month, these ones are not re recalled or they're not said to be set apart days that I know of in what's called the Bible. I may be mistaken, but it just isn't in there. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, 
you have the fact that Yom Teru is called the Day of Remembrance, just like this one. Those four days are specifically said to be Sabbaths, and you have the, um, it's the first of the first year, specifically mentioned in a different scroll that mentions that it is also a Sabbath. So these are things that not a lot of, not everyone might be aware of, and it's not to point fingers and condemn anybody, but these are things that we want to keep in mind if we actually want to do his desire, right? Mm -hmm. But these are ordained as testimonies forever, is what he says here. And Noah ordained them for himself as feasts for the generations forever, so that they become thereby a memorial unto him. And those four are also carried over even into our times as the four Hodesh. <laughs> when you're looking at the scriptures, and this is my contention there, when you read the Bible accounts of the Hodesh anywhere, when they're keeping that, it's going to be one of these four. I don't believe that they did that every month there because it's just not, it's not written anywhere to do that. But that's a different topic for a different time. Um, right here. It mentions the significance of the seventh month, which is what we want to cover. It was on the first month of the seventh month that all the mouths of the abysses of the earth were opened and the waters began to descend into them. So that was the memorial of why he kept that. It was when the waters, after the flooding for 150 days, I believe were it was in there. And then he opens up the abysses and allows it to drain. That right will help you get so. all right so the next reference we have and this actually doesn't mention the first of the seventh month but it's in there and this is when noah planted the vineyard right he kept it and gathered it in the seventh month which is the time of in gathering when you'd go and keep you know, the festival sukkot as well now, right here is the next reference that I'm familiar with in any part of Scripture. It's also in the book of Yobelim. This is chapter 12. Brother Kerry was already mentioning it earlier. But this is the... Oh, sorry, we got someone's voice coming through. It says, but this is the chapter where Abraham destroys the idols that Terok, his father, is the priest over in... Ur of the Kazdim, and where he repents and turns to our Creator, he prays to be delivered from evil spirits. So we'll go ahead and just read that section. But it's from chapter 12, starting at verse 16. And in the sixth week, in the fifth year thereof, or 1951 Aniomundi, Abraham sat up throughout the night on the new month of the seventh month, to observe the stars from the evening to the morning, in order to see what would be the character of the year with regards to the rains. And he was alone as he sat and observed. The fact that he learned of our Creator through the stars, I forgot to mention when Brother Kerry was talking about that, is directly mentioned by Kepha in what's called the Recognitions of Clement. It says that he, being familiar with the stars as an as uh, one of the wise men of Babylon, right, or being uh, trained as the Chaldeans there, he recognized the Creator when all other men were going astray. And it was from that that he prayed in what we're going to read right here. It says, And a word came into his heart, and he said, All the signs of the stars and the signs of the moon and of the sun are in the hand of Yahuwah. Why do I search them out? If he desires, he causes it to rain, morning and evening. And if he desires, he withholds it, and all things are in his hand. And he prayed that night and said, My Elohim, or my sovereign ruler, Yahuwah Elion, or Most High, you alone are my Elohim, and you and your dominion have I chosen, and you have created all things, and all things are the work of your hands. Deliver me from the hands of evil ruachoth, or spirits, who have dominion over the thoughts of men's hearts, and let them not lead me astray from you, my Elohim. And establish you, me, and my seed forever, that we go not astray from henceforth 
and forevermore. And he said, Shall I return unto Ur of the Chaldeans, or the Kazdim? Remember, um, the Hebrew word Kazdim is kof and then shadim, so it's to be like demons. And that would be the ones that are following the practices that are not profitable. The writings of the watchers, if you will. <clears throat> It says, and I shall return, or shall I return unto Ur of the Kazdim, who seek my face that I may return to them? Am I to remain here in this place? The right path before you prosper it in the hands of your servant that he may fulfill it, and that I may not walk in the deceitfulness of my heart, Yahuwah, my Elohim. And he made an end of speaking and praying, and behold, the word of Yahuwah was sent to him through me the messenger of the presence who's speaking to Moshe, who, okay, saying, get you up from your country and from your kindred and from the house of your father unto a land which I will show you, and I shall make you a great and numerous nation. And I will barak you, and I will make your name great, and you shall be a blessing, or blessed in the earth, rather, and in you shall all families of the earth be baruch. And I will barak or bless them that bless you, and curse them that curse you. And I will be Elohim to you and your son, and to your son's son, and to all your seed. Now, this is important, because he everyone that asks is given, right? I don't want to cut too much here. But remember what he just prayed for, that he would be his sovereign, his Elohim, and for him and his seed forever. And he gives him for you, for your son, and for your son's son, and to all your seed. So it wasn't to literally every child that came from him, but to the ones that were going to be of him in covenant he, he gave to him, to always have a righteous remnant. And that was one of the things that Louis, or Levi, prayed for in his testament that you can read that he relied on the law the promises given saying you said that abraham would always have a righteous descendant and i'm asking you to make me that one right very same thing abraham's doing here praying and petitioning it's well, let me interject something here yes brother uh remember when the said uh if a if a son asks his father for a piece of bread would he give him a stone Absolutely, yeah. And and so if we ask him for spiritual things, wouldn't he give it to us? Absolutely, brother. So long as we don't mm -hmm. we even don't doubt. Right. Thank you for that. And he says, and to all your seed. So literally it was from Abraham to Yitzhak and from Yitzhak <laughs> to Yaakov. And then from Yaakov to all this, all of his seed, all 12 sons were accepted. But it wasn't always after that. It was for those that were still walking in covenant. We have the example in, in the scriptures of the 75 that came in, but only 70 are accounted. If you remember, or if you're familiar with the Testament of Dan, his children get wiped out while, after they enter into Egypt and they're counted amongst the nations, just like Ur, and uh, Onan, the uh, sons of Yahuda that died from the Canaanite Bathsheba. <clears throat> but I'm just trying to point out the things that it shows is also true to the word, to the letter. It played out these in the physical here and then in a larger scale later on, just like Brother Earl was talking about. But real quick, let's finish this part because it's it's amazing. It all has to do with the first of the seventh month here. And it says, and to all your seed, fear not from henceforth and unto all generations of the earth. I am Yahuwah, your Elohim. And Yahuwah Almighty said, open his mouth and his ears that he may hear and speak with his mouth with the language which has been revealed. For it had ceased from the mouths of all the children of men from the day of the overthrow. And I opened his mouth and his ears and his lips, and I began to speak with him in the Hebrew, the what we have in the Bible. It never actually calls it Hebrew that I'm familiar with, other than in the Renewed Covenant writings. But the um, 
the language of the Yahudim or the language of the Jews as it's translated in English is Yahudith in the Hebrew. And that would be the, the language of those who confess, acknowledge, and praise Yahuwah. But Hebrew, you know, Eber, it's the one who crosses over. So it's, it's the language of those who cross over. It's the language of creation. It's also known as the language of the ones who praise, acknowledge, and confess Yahuwah, he who exists, right? Avery, Avery. Avery, yes, brother. What was that, brother Earl? Was that Paleo Hebrew? I'm sorry, was what Paleo Hebrew? You used to have the language of the Yahudi. Oh, and it's an original Hebrew. font. As far as I'm aware, the original font was with the what they call the Paleo. There's also some yeah. people mentioned the pictograph which they say predates it. I don't know of any writings that exist in that other than there are some writings in Egypt. I believe there is some, it says there's a prayer to El Elyon in a turquoise mine in Egypt in the pictograph. I don't know if there's any other writing like that, but I do know that the, the paleo, is what you have the Ten Commandments written on stone here in Las Lunas, New Mexico. It was what was witnessed in the older writings. It's how his name was written when it was preserved in the Paleo-Hebrew in the Dead Sea Scrolls and before the 300s AD when they used to have Greek manuscripts that had his name preserved with the Paleo, they would use that font. So I don't know... If anyone else has other information on the pictograph, I'd be more interested in learning it because that's not that's not something I'm familiar with. There is a gentleman. I've, uh, I've got, yeah, Father showed me uh, the meaning of his name uh, through all the all the letters and also through the three signs of, that he gave to Moses. Excellent. So I'd be willing to share that with you sometime. Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. all right let's finish this one real quick it says and he took the books of his fathers and they were written in hebrew and he transcribed them and he began from henceforth to study them and i made known to him that which he could not and he studied them during the six rainy months so the one of the most significant things after that remembrance on this appointed time was that he put it into the mind of Abram to pray, and he was delivered from evil spirits by getting the words that were handed down from his forefathers and the language to comprehend them. Something that we ought to keep in mind. And it was it was that because he studied the, the scrolls, he understood what the constellations meant and, and what the stars meant and all that. Absolutely. He was given the wisdom of Hanok and all the ancients. Literally, the unabridged version of Hanok would have had the names of every star, every coming and going of all the luminaries was was said to be marked down. And we don't have any of that today. So you're absolutely on point with that, too. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know if you... It's me again. I don't know if you recognize, you said he transcribed them and then he studied them. That tells me that anybody can read the word and they can have a definition of every word on the page. But that's not understanding. Just because you know that you can quote it doesn't mean you understand it. Mm -hmm. For that, sure. you have to go to the uh, Ruach. Exactly. I agree. That's perfect. I had a moment with the Matthew 13. I, I read it, you know, like all of us several different times. And then I got woke up in the middle of the night and I heard an audible voice that said, read Matthew 13. And I'm thinking to myself, I already know it. <laughs> and that stern voice said, read it again. <laughs> so I thought, okay, I'll clear my mind and read it again. And this time I kind of put everything I thought I knew aside, started reading it again. And got a whole different understanding i was like wow i never saw that before it was probably it was pretty cool once that happened i love when that happens yep. 
get something new or something you haven't read for a little while and then you've had a fresh comprehension come when you look at it again Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's it happens a lot if you're willing to open your mind yes, sir and be humble right Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the next reference we have for the first of the seventh month it skips through the patriarch Yitzhak um, although there are references to when he was being foretold as the promised seed to Abraham um, the institution of festivals in the seventh month but it's not specifically this day however when you get to Yobelim or Jubilees chapter 31 when Yaakov is returning to to the land when he's come back from his sojourning to collect for himself wives and possession and to, he said everything that's not spotted or speckled has nothing to do with me is a type of what our Mashiach was doing in the laboring for his own possessions before coming back right mm -hmm. this is what was foretold in our patriarch in regard to that okay so it says, and on the new month of the month, Yaakov spoke to all the people of his house, saying, Purify yourselves and change your garments, and let us arise and go up to Bethel, where I vowed a vow to him on the day when I fled from the face of Esau, my brother. Because he has been with me and brought me into this land in Shalom, and put you away the strange mighty ones that are among you. Which it, we were, we just went over this in Bereshit not too long ago. The word for the idols there is not just a word for an idol. It's a got a hidden meaning for unprofitable worthlessness or something to do with that. I highly recommend you check that out again. I'll go ahead and find that word and put it in the description when we have it there. Just because I remember when we went through it, it stood out to me. And I thought it was rather interesting. But the answer for our problems is in the stuff that you can read in the original language as well. Yes. It says, and they gave up the strange mighty ones and that which was in their ears and which was on their necks and the idols which Rachel or Rachel stole from Laban her father. She gave holy to Yaakov and he burnt and break them to pieces and destroyed them and hid them under an oak which was in the land of Shechem. And he went up on the new month of the seventh month to Bethel. And he built an altar at the place where he had slept. And he set up a pillar there. And he sent word to his father Yitzhak to come to him to his sacrifice and to his mother Ribka or Rebecca. And Yitzhak said, Let my son Yaakov come and let me see him before I die. And Yaakov went to his father Yitzhak and to his mother Rebekah, to the house of his father Abraham, and he took two sons of his with him, or two of his sons with him, Louis and Yahuda. And he came to his father Yitzhak and to his mother Rebekah, or Ribka. And Rebekah came forth from the tower, that was that tower that Abraham had built that Brother Kerry was talking about earlier, right? And he came forth from the tower to the front of it to kiss Yaakov and embrace him. For her spirit had revived when she heard, Behold, Yaakov, your son is come. And she kissed him. And she saw his two sons, and she recognized them, and said to him, Are these your sons, my son? And she embraced them and kissed them, and Barak them, saying, In you shall the seed of Abraham become illustrious and you shall prove a blessing on the earth through the two sons. It's not stated so clearly in what we call the Bible because it's known that he would come through Yahuda, and he's from the tribe of Yahuda through his, through his descent. But if you recall, it, it says here, and it mentions in the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs, it mentions... and. I believe there's other places too, but even in the good news account, if you recall, Miriam is related to Elizabeth or Elisheba, and Elisheba was of the sons of Aaron and a daughter of them and married to Zechariah, who was a Kohen of the sons of Aaron. So the lines were intermarried there, proving 
what is foretold all throughout that he would come through the two of them, although the direct line was from Yahuda, again, married in. So you see it right here. It says, And Yaakov went in to Yitzhak his father, to the chamber where he lay, and his two sons were with him. And he took the hand of his father, and stooping down, he kissed him. And Yitzhak clung to the neck of Yaakov his son, and wept upon his neck. And the darkness left the eyes of Yitzhak. And he saw the two sons of Yaakov, Louis and Yahuda, and he said, Are these your sons, my son? For they are like you. And he said to him, That they are truly his sons, and you have been you have truly seen that they are truly my sons. And they came near to him, and he turned and kissed them and embraced them both together. And the Ruach of foretelling came down into his mouth. And he took Louis by his right hand and Yahuda by his left. And he turned to Louis first and he began to barak him first and said to him, May Shaddai of all, or the Almighty of all, the very Yahuwah of all ages, barak you and your children throughout all the ages. And may Yahuwah give to you and to your seed greatness and great splendor and cause you and your seed from among all flesh to approach him, to serve in his sanctuary as the messenger of the presence, like the light of the sun, like our Mashiach, right? As a Kohen. And as the Kodesh ones, even as they shall the seed of your sons be for splendor and greatness and set-apartness, and may he make them great unto all the ages." And they shall be judges and princes and chiefs of all the seed of the sons of Yaakov. They shall speak the word of Yahuwah in righteousness, and they shall judge in all judge or in all his judgments in righteousness. And they shall declare my ways to Yaakov and my paths to Yisrael. The Baraka or blessing of Yahuwah shall be given in their mouths to bless all the seed of the beloved. Remember, the seed is the word, but the seed of the beloved are those that have the word in them. Your mother has called your name Louis, joined unto me, right? And justly or rightly has she called your name. You shall be joined to Yahuwah and be the companion of all the sons of Yaakov. Let his table be yours, and do you and your sons eat thereof. And may your table be full unto all generations, and your food fail not unto all the ages. And let all who hate you fall down before you, and let all your adversaries be rooted out and perish. And Baruch be he that Barak you, and cursed be every nation that curses you. These are saying because the truth was going to be carried down in them until the coming of our Mashiach, in which that is always applicable, right? Oh. It was to them because they are the partakers of the truth. It, Amen. So that would be, and just for a recap, this is like we're going to be Kohanim and kings with him during the millennial reign. This is a foreshadow type of thing. It was given to Louis and Yahuda, and then later to their children. And that's part of that thing that keeps playing out where you see what has been is what will be, like Brother Earl was talking about, where you have these echoes, if you will. And to Yahuda he said, May Yahuwah give you strength and power to tread down all that hate you. A prince shall you be, you and one of your sons over the sons of Yaakov. May your name and the name of your sons go forth and traverse every land and region. Well, we can get into that more later, but... Um, the idea of someone from the seed of Yahuda reigning in an area where men tread is foretold earlier to Yaakov. And you can see it playing out, especially when you look into the sons of Yahu, Pater, Jupiter, and all that other stuff that became paganized. But it was really the seed of Yahuda that was leading those people. And we've already covered that in a few different places. So we don't want to get into that now. But it says, Then shall the Gentiles fear before your face, and all the nations shall quake, and all the people shall quake. In you shall be the help of Yaakov, and in you be found the deliverance of Yisrael. 
And when you sit on the throne of honor of your righteousness, there shall be great shalom for all the seed of the sons of the beloved. Baruch be he that barak you or blesses you, and all that hate you and afflict you and curse you shall be rooted out and destroyed from the earth and accursed. Now, that that's for the Yahudim. And just because of this, it doesn't say they're beloved for the sakes of the fathers, although they're enemies in regard to the truth. It doesn't mean that this isn't true. And it's why we should be careful about the things that we choose to say about others. It's also why we should not curse the leaders or people in positions of authority. Because if they're from Yahuda, we curse ourselves. It's um, the literal truth. Just like we were trying to profess all of his word literally true. It's the reason why we should be peaceable and not having problems with the words of our mouth. But it says, in turning, he kissed him again and embraced him and rejoiced greatly, for he had seen the sons of Jacob, his son, in very truth. All right. And then right there. It says, and he went forth from between his feet and fell down and bowed down to him, and he blessed them and rested there with Yitzhak, his father, that night, and they ate and drank with joy. What we're commanded to do, too. And he made his two or the two sons of Jacob sleep, the one on his right hand and the other on his left, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And Jacob told his father everything during the night. Another theme for this day, just like Abram was given revelation, you see that he is showing revelation here too. And how Yahuwah had shown him great mercy, and how he had prospered him in all his ways and protected him from all evil and Yitzhak Barak Yahuwah Almighty of his father Abraham who had not withdrawn his mercy and his righteousness from the sons of his servant Yitzhak all right and then that's the last reference in the uh, book of Yobelim so the next ones that we have that I'm familiar with uh, would be right here in Leviticus. We'll go ahead and read that real quick. Mm -hmm. This would be during the time of Moshe, okay, when he was given the commands. And I haven't shown it here. There's a section in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It is, I'll have to find it again. I shared it in the Telegram just this morning. But it shows how when the children were taken out of Egypt and brought to Mount Sinai, they were given a type of the renewed covenant that was in esteem by our Mashiach, right? So this is a four, it was a type of that, but he would have already had these, as we saw, established before in the patriarchs. And that was the original time of the covenant. So you can see there's another witness for that kind of thing. But right here, this is Leviticus 23, verses 23 through 25. And Yahuwah spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, or Chodesh, you have a rest, a remembrance of Teruah. You do no servile work, and you shall bring an offering made by fire to Yahuwah. That is expounded on here in chapter 29 of the Midbar or Numbers. It says, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you have a set-apart gathering. You do no servile work, meaning you don't work for money. You, you shouldn't pay people or buy things or do stuff where you're rendering, having services rendered, right? Nor should you do that yourself. It is Yom Teruah, and you shall prepare an ascending offering as a sweet fragrance to Yahuwah, one young bull, one ram, seven lambs a year old, perfect ones, and their grain offering, fine flour mixed with oil, three-tenths of an ephah for the bull, two-tenths for the ram, and one-tenth for each of the seven lambs, and one male goat as a sin offering, to make atonement for you besides the ascending offering with its grain offerings for the Chodesh, or for the new month, the continual ascending offering with its grain offering, and their drink offerings according to the right ruling, as a sweet fragrance, an offering made by fire to Yahuwah. 
Now that might sound a little confusing, but just to the one bull, the ram, the seven lambs, these are the uh, and the goat offering. These are specific for the day, and there's reasons for that. But aside from that, just for the Kodesh, you have the offerings that are given for those that are specific for the Kodeshim, the remembrance days that you are to do. And then you have the continual offerings, the what is that which is continual, as it was mentioned by the what was continual being taken away, is the morning and evening offerings of the Lamb. So all of those are still required on top of the other ones there. And that was during the time of the trainer when the children had broken the law with the golden calf and they had the added bonds of transgression. It was no longer if you sacrifice, but then now you must, and you must do it in these ways and you must do it with a specific specificity. That stuff was done away with when our Mashiach came, but it was instituted at this time. The last reference in the scriptures that we have, there is a reference to the, the seventh month in the festival keeping during the reign of Shalomo, which is reminiscent of the millennial reign as well. But that doesn't specifically mention the first of the seventh month. The one that we do have reference for is in Nehemiah right here. And that has to do with the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, the return from the captivity of Babylon, both in their times, the original Babel, and what you'd call after the Reformation in later years for our purposes. It says, And when the seventh month came, the children of Israel were in their cities, and all the people gathered together as one man. Oh, I'm sorry. Before I read this one, there's one more reference that we have to cover. After the times of Moshe, but before this period, you have... Gad the seer, who was contemporary with Dawid and Shalomo, um, but before about 500 years before the captivity in Babylon. This isn't right here, and it came to pass. This is Gad the seer, chapter 14. Okay, and it came to pass on the first day of the seventh month in the head of the year, which that is what they say for, um the civil year for the Yahudim in the land. It's not the really the beginning of the year, but it is in the text there. It says, In the 478th year after the children of Yisrael were come out of the land of Mitzrayim, or Egypt, in the second year of Shalomo's reign over Yisrael, it mentions the 480th year was the fourth year of his reign. So this is actually a witness that goes along with Scripture. The two hundred 2,888 years from creation is what it would be in regard to the book of Jubilees. It says, Yahuwah's vision came unto me, Gad, and I was upon the Gihon. And I raised my eyes, and behold, the Shamayim were opened like a book. And I saw the esteem of Yahuwah sitting on a lofty and exceedingly high throne. And the appearance, and this is the appearance of the throne. Twelve stairs led up to the throne, six of gold and six of silver. And there was a square back to the throne like a sapphire stone. And at its right side were three stools, and at its left side were four stools near the sitting place, like the seven that see the king's face. And those are the chief messengers that are mentioned in the book of Hanok and elsewhere. Covered with gold and silver and precious stones. And the appearance of the esteem of Yahuwah was like a, like the appearance of the rainbow, his covenant. And the host of the Shamayim were standing before him on his right hand and on his left. And Hashatan was standing by them, but behind them. And behold, a man dressed in linen, right, brought before the esteem of Yahuwah three books that were written about every man. And he read in the first one, and it was found to have the righteous deeds of his people. And Yahuwah said, these will live forever. And that would be the lamb reading from the, his book of life there. And Hashatan said, who are these guilty people? And the man dressed in linen cried to Hashatan like a ram's horn saying, keep silent for this day is Kadosh to our Adon. 
and he read in the second book, and it was found to have the inadvertent sins of his people. And Yahuwah said, Put aside this book, but save it until one third of the month elapses to see what they will do. And one third of the month is the tenth, which would be the Day of Atonement. Unintentional cinders afflicting themselves on that day. And he read in the third book, and it was found to have the malicious deeds of his people. And Yahuwah said to HaShatan, These are your share. Take them and do with them as it seems fit to you. And HaShatan took those who acted maliciously, and he went with them to a wasteland to destroy them there. And the man dressed in linen cried like a ram's horn, saying, Happy is the people that know the, know the joyful shout. They walk, Yahuwah, in the light of your countenance or presence. And I heard the voice of the host of the Shamayim dancing and saying, Master of righteousness, Yahuwah Zavaoth, the whole, or Yahuwah of hosts, the whole Shamayim in earth is full of his esteem. And I was shocked by the vision, since I did not know what Yahuwah had done for me. Then flew unto me one of the cherubs, and he put an olive leaf in my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your mouth, and your inequity is taken away, and your sin expiated, which means to be completely removed. And this Torah that you have seen is a statute for Yisrael, and a law to the El of Abraham. And shalom unto Yitzhak, your father. And Yahuwah will barak your people in the trial with shalom forever. And I said, Amen. May Yahuwah, our Elohim, do this for us forever and ever. And the messenger answered, Amen and Amen. So, I love that part. That's probably my most significant one. You can see this is perpetually what's supposed to happen every day in the Shamayim this year, where those books are opened and it is read before him. <clears throat> That's supposed to be our comfort, but um, it's really only a comfort for those who are not sinning. And if you have sinned, then wow. it gives us the remedy. We turn to the one who covers our sins with his own blood, and then through love of the truth, Mashiach compels us to do what he said. Right, mm -hmm. But right here now, this is the last reference that I'm familiar with in this section. And it's from Nehemiah chapter 8. It says, And when the seventh month came, the children of Israel were in their cities, and all the people gathered together as one man in the open space that was in front of the water gate. And they spoke to Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the Torah of Moshe, which Yahuwah had commanded Israel. And Ezra the Kohen brought, that's what priest means in Hebrew is Kohen, brought the Torah before the assembly of both men and women, and all who could hear with comprehension or understanding, on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it in the open space in front of the water gate, from morning until midday, before the men and women and those who could comprehend. And the ears of all the people And yeah, and the ears of all the people to the book of the Torah. That's the literal Hebrew. They had in italics or in uh, a bracket, it said listened, but it's literally, and the ears of all the people to the book of the Torah. And Ezra the scribe stood on a platform of wood, which they had made for the purpose. I, I don't know if you guys can see the, the parable here, but it's the beginning of the seventh month. It's the one bringing the word on wood before all the people at the water gate pouring out stuff. There's a lot of illusions here if you can think about it. Think about the timeline and everything that's going on too. <clears throat> I wonder if it has anything to do with the, the Feast of Wood because they just brought the, the wood, uh, the priests brought the wood uh, to the temple. The fresh cut wood. Yes, sir. That would have been previously done right before the beginning of the first of the seventh month. Absolutely. 
there is another reference to being on a platform of wood as well. When Dawid is older, he gives a speech to all the people on the platform in the book of Gad the Seer. So there's another allusion to something of that nature. But it does not take place. It doesn't mention the first of the seventh month there. Okay. But thank you for that, brother. Mm -hmm. It says, and beside him on his right stood Matityah, or Matityahu and Shema, and Anya and Oriyah, and Chilkiah and Maaseyah. And on his left stood Padayah and Mishael, and Milkiyahu, and Hashum, and Hashbadana, <laughs> Zechariah, and Meshalum. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. And this is where Shaul says, stand then, having been, right, after you've died with him and you've been raised together. That's an illusion that after they, you know, they came back from Babylon and they're all standing here. There's a, there's a type of picture there. So, um, excuse me, brother. Um, isn't that even as in the book of Fourth Ezra or Second Ezra, when the people even come to him and they ask where he's been, as he's speaking to them in the captivity? Yes, that is mentioned in the book of 4th Ezra or 2nd Ezdraeus, where they're coming to him. That's when, that was when he was off in the, separating himself and fasting, like he was being inquired, re required to do. Absolutely. I don't know when that would have been in regard to this point. It could have been, well, it would have been beforehand, because this is after he has the book that he's actually reading to them. So, Actually, thank you for sharing that. Hadn't thought about that before. But if you remember, 4th Ezra or 2nd Ezdraeus is where he inquires because he's going to be taken to paradise. And he asks Yahuwah that he can be given the Ruach to write down the words for the people because it had been destroyed. But you see here, they have the book and he's reading it to them. So that would have been after the scribes and him had spent 40 days doing that. Hmm. Is Ezra Baruch or blessed Yahuwah, the great Elohim? It says, then all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshiped Yahuwah with faces to the ground. And Yeshua, and Benai, and Seribia, Yemen, Akob, Shabithai, Hodiahu, Maasayah, Kelita or yeah, Kelita, Azariahu, Yozabad, Hanan, Leia, and the Luiim or the Levites, if you will, caused the people to understand the Torah while the people were in their place. And they read in the book of the Torah of Elohim, translating to give the sense and cause to and cause to understand the reading. Again, Revelation, comprehension, the giving of the word, mm -hmm. significant for the day, right? Mm -hmm. And Kemiyahu, who was the governor, and Ezra the Kohen, the scribe, and the Luiim, or the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is Kadosh la Yahuwah, or set apart to Yahuwah, your Elohim. Do not mourn or weep. Okay? For all the people wept when they heard the words of the Torah. Then he said to them, Go eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to those for whom none is prepared. For this day is Kadosh to our master. Do not be sad, for the joy of Yahuwah is your strength. And Yahuwah, or sorry, and the Luiim were silencing all the people, saying, Hush, for the day is Kadosh, do not be sad. And all the people went to eat and to drink, and to send portions and to make a great rejoicing, because they understood the words that were made known to them. And this is what we should be rejoicing about. Remember, if you go and look at what was in Yobelim for the times of Abraham and Yitzhak being born, it was in the seventh month, he was rejoicing because it was being made known to him too, and the fulfillment of it as well. 
I love this portion of Nehemiah. Me as well, brother. I think it's awesome. It is incredible. You know, when I when the priest told them to hush while they were weeping, it's like, you know, when whenever they whenever they repent, he immediately forgives. You Absolutely. know, he doesn't drag it on and drag it on. He immediately uh gives you forgiveness. Hallelujah. And he said he's not like man to hold a grudge, which I'm very thankful for. Absolutely. So I, I'm terribly sorry about this last part. It was actually, it's missing, or it's um, it's not missing. My computer is not allowing me to go on Telegram at the moment. The, the app is not working. But what I'd wanted to do um, was to show you what our sister Natalie had shared. And maybe I can still do that. There's two of them here. Yeah, let me let me hop on real quick with my phone. Let me pause the recording real quick, hop on, and then in the meantime, do you if you guys have any comments or questions or anything, we can do that. All right, shalom, everyone. This is what our sister put together and she had shared. This has the reference in scripture. You can see it has the what we call the Bible and then extra verses um, to do with Yom Teruah and then verses on the shofar. It's not always it, it specifically about Yom Teruah itself, but it is about the shout, whether it's the joyful shout from the Psalms or like what you can read from... The, the shofars, I don't know if it mentions um, Yahushua here, but the falling of the, the wall of Jericho. Uh, there's different references to the ram's horn and where it's used. So you can look at that, pause and take it. And then there's one more right here that shows the day of trumpets or the first of the seventh month in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which I think is very worthwhile to take a, a look at. Some of these, again, are mentions of shofar blasts and not the, the festival specifically. The trumpets of remembrance are used during the, the war. This is reminiscent of the last battle, like when Yahushua, son of Nun, brought them into the land. The war mm -hmm. is like the last battles between the Katim and, and other things before the end. So they have the trumpets of remembrance that are used there. Then you have mm -hmm. the festival prayers that mention the first of the seventh month there's different significances here one of these i believe it is um i believe it's around 310s or 323 it's in the testament of louis where some significant things happen with the birth of his children in the first of the seventh month i believe it's uh amram and yokebed but i'd have to double check again but you can look at these and also get a sense of what is written in regard to Yom Teruah as well for a fuller understanding. And I highly encourage everyone to do that. But thank you all for your time. You have a wonderful Sabbath today, a wonderful week ahead, and a great fall festivals coming up. Thank you. So shalom.